Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Room for Discussion. Today we have the opportunity of interviewing one of the most relevant figures uh, in tackling the economic impact of the corona crisis. It is surely a pleasure for me, Alexander, to be joining, joined by Mr. Philip Lane, Chief Economist of the ECB. And before we start our interview, we have two quick remarks about how we're going to conduct the entire session. And the first one is that, as usual, we're going to have time for audience questions. And this time, we would like you to submit your audience questions in our Facebook Live comment section. And um, throughout the, the interview, our colleague here, Joaquin, will give us the questions and you'll be able to ask them through our voices to Mr. Lane. Do not shy away and please um, make sure to send your questions, of course. And the second uh, remark is that before we start the interview, we'll have some quick remarks on the way the ECB is tackling the crisis from Mr. Lane. So without further ado, Mr. Lane, thank you for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you. So uh, I very much appreciate the invitation. Of course, uh, when the invitation originally came to me, it was before the uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. And uh, my anticipation is that without that uh, uh, virus uh, coming along, the focus of the, uh, of the discussion would be on our medium-term monetary policy. So let me start with medium-term monetary policy before tur turning to the crisis. So if you go back in time to, for example, the end of 2019, uh, essentially the, at the end of 2019, uh, when we made our forecast at that point, uh, essentially we were directing our monetary policy in order to uh, raise the inflation rate from around 1% where it's been around 1% for a few years, in order to raise it to around 2%. And uh, to deliver that uh, inflation rate, and of course, uh, by the way, around the world, uh, cent pretty much every major central bank uh, desires an inflation rate around 2%. Uh, in order to, to get to 2%, we had a, a negative interest rate policy. Uh, we had a targeted lending program and we had an asset purchase program where we would uh, be very active in buying up uh, sovereign, sovereign debt, corporate debt, in order to keep interest rates low enough that, uh, if you like, the level of economic activity in Europe would go up over time, which would allow an increase in wages and an increase in prices. So that, that was our, our challenge, that was our policy coming into this crisis. So uh, with this crisis, of course, uh, there's many dimensions to it. Um, and uh, what we're seeing right now, here we are in May 2020, uh, this period when a lot of the world economy has been uh, on pause because of the public health measures, uh, we, we think uh, there's been a very big drop in activity uh, since the start of 2020. Now, we also think over time, uh, as the economy uh, recovers, there will be a significant recovery, but the big debate is whether that recovery will be 100% or only partial, and also how long uh, these uh, social distancing measures will be needed. Uh, will it be another year? Uh, will it be longer, or will it be shorter than that? So when you have a situation where very quickly, in the month of March, and I think the, the key period was the middle of March, uh, the world has some, you know, really very quickly had to understand that this is a, a very major economic shock, uh, a, a really large decline in economic activity in the short run, and therefore it was important for central banks everywhere, including the ECB, to respond. Number one is if you think there's going to be a large uh, decline in economic activity, then uh, I think uh, most economic models would say then uh, medium-term inflation is also going to fall. So we already ha had a, a priority to raise the inflation rate from one to around two. Now uh, there was a risk that the inflation rate would not only not get to one, it might fall to a lower number or even go negative. So all central banks uh, would be very concerned about the scenario we faced and we, we had to uh, act. In addition, in a crisis situation where suddenly 
all the assumptions that the financial markets had have been rewritten. Uh, there's a lot of uh, risk of instability in the uh, corporate bond market, in the equity market, uh, potentially in, in the uh, way banks operate. And therefore, a very classic role for a central bank is to step in to stabilize, uh, to stabilize um, the normal activity of banks by providing liquidity and to stabilize the operation of financial markets. So again, uh, we've seen this everywhere, the Fed, uh, uh, Bank of Japan, and here in Europe at the ECB. So in order to deliver uh, what was needed in the middle of March, uh, you know, we basically stepped up our existing programs. Uh, for example, the targeted lending scheme. Uh, we in increased the availability of uh, liquidity. And then uh, in the middle of March, we also launched what's known as the PEP, the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program. And this uh, purchase program uh, is essentially intended uh, for two reasons. One is to stabilize uh, the financial markets at risk of disruption. And two is to provide the extra monetary accommodation needed to make sure that inflation, uh, the risk of inflation going to uh, towards zero or even negative to be addressed. So this is uh, the main activity of the ECB these days. Uh, keep the banking system liquid, keep the financial system liquid, make sure that the lending rates available to firms and households are as low as, as needed in this uh, situation. And so if you like, there's been a, a we're in the middle of a global shock. And I think the world central banking community uh, has been very busy on those fronts. Uh, banking supervisor for Europe. And so the uh, super single supervisory mechanism at the ECB or led by the ECB has also been making sure the way uh, banks operate is directed at keeping credit flowing in this period. Uh, and of course, uh, everywhere, uh, there's a very big role for governments both in terms of the, the public health emergency, but also through fiscal policy, supporting uh, all the workers and all the firms that have been uh, shut down for this uh, public health uh, public health reasons. So uh, that's where we are, uh, and maybe it's better if I if I stop now and uh, in, invite uh, the questions you may you may have. So back over to you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Lane. Those were very interesting remarks. I think that everybody got a very good overview of what the ECB is doing. And before we delve into more a more detailed conversation about all the tools that you mentioned, we'd like to first go back one week in which a very um, perhaps salient news was all over financial, the Financial Times, Bloomberg, etc. And that was the ruling of the German uh, Federal Constitutional Court. So basically, th the ruling said that the ECB had three months to, to, to prove that there was no verge of the proportionality principle in their um, public sector purchase program that was uh, in place in 2015. Our question to you, Mr. Lane, is we can imagine that you were perhaps one of the first ones to get this briefing from, from the ruling of the court. What was the first thing that crossed your mind? So, of course, uh, last week, like everyone, uh, as you know, I, I'm sure everywhere court judgments are not pre-released. Pre uh, we would have uh, seen them at the same time as everyone else uh, when they were uploaded uh, to the website and when, when the judgment was read out. Um, so I, I think um, we uh, subsequently, the same day, uh, we, we put out a statement later that evening, basically saying, you know, we, we've taken note of the judgment and also uh, recalling that we do operate in a legal framework. So the ECB, it's very important. We're a very independent institution, but in the context of the European treaty. And uh, so it, it's something we value, the, the fact that we operate within a legal framework. And the statement we put out last week uh, basically uh, uh, restated that the European Court of Justice has looked at our uh, public, public sector purchase program, and as you know, has uh, judged it to be within uh, our mandate. So it's very important uh, that that uh, to make the point that uh, 
you know, independent central banks need to be able to uh, explain uh, and be accountable for what they're doing. And uh, through the European Parliament and through the European Court of Justice, uh, we perform that. Uh, and uh, let me uh, emphasize in that is that essentially, you know, that we have a very clear mandate. Our mandate, the primary responsibility is to de deliver price stability. And essentially, all of our actions are assessed and, uh, you know, motivated by uh, what is needed to deliver price stability. So maybe um, let me emphasize in this uh, context uh, that uh, around the world, so it's not, it's not remotely uh, something that's unique to the Euro area, uh, we, we have these pressures, which mean that the, the kind of uh, working of the economy uh, requires very low interest rates. So uh, the way economists normally think about that is we have an underlying economic force, which is basically uh, quite a high uh, desire to save. So whether that's uh, people um, you know, in my age group uh, <laughs> looking to save for retirement, uh, whether it's, uh, if you like, uh, a greater appreciation maybe than historically that uh, disasters can happen. So disasters like the uh, global financial crisis, uh, natural disasters like we have now, like a pandemic. So if you like, there's a, f a phrase called precautionary saving. Yeah. So there's been a more precautionary saving, I, I think. Uh, and then also for a number of years, uh, governments had been uh, quite uh, cautious. So uh, in Europe, uh, the amount of uh, public deficits w had been quite low since the global financial crisis. So there's a big increase in the crisis, but then it been quite low in recent years. So, Mr. so what that meant is... Uh, would please. you say that then the, the ruling itself, it won't have any effect on the way monetary policy is being conducted in DCB? Or do you think it would? So again, uh, to repeat, uh, we've already had the legal assessment that this, this policy is uh, within uh, what's permitted within our mandate. But, but I think, you know, I think behind all, all of the discussion, uh, the deeper issue is essentially why are we in a world where interest rates are so low? And uh, let me again come back to, to that. One is, I've said, there's a high desire to save, and that's married with uh, an investment rate that's lower than historically normal. Uh, and uh, with this new crisis now, those trends, I think, are reinforced, at least for now. And so what does that mean for the central bank? It means if you have a situation where the, the world economy and the European economy uh, needs a low interest rate to, to maintain activity, and if inflation is low, then if you like, the, the monetary interest rate that we set is, is going to be low. And in fact, it's been negative in uh, recent years. And then what does that mean? It means if that is not enough, if inflation is uh, below targets, or if there's a negative shock, then uh, in addition to the main instrument of the monetary interest rate, we also have to do asset purchases. And this is, if you like, something that's been much debated, I know, across Europe, because it, it sounds uh, odd. It sounds something that uh, um, is not in the traditional textbook. But in fact, historically, it's been uh, used widely. And look, look now what's happening. At the Fed, there's a very large uh, asset purchase program. It's been resumed at the Bank of England, uh, Bank of Japan. Now the Bank of Canada is getting going. So if you like, it, it's what was seen maybe five years ago as an unconventional measure is now, if you like, very much the needed. It's orthodox. Right. It's how a central bank in, in these conditions is going to operate. Right. Right, Mr. Lane, we will definitely touch on all these things you're talking about in the asset purchasing program, the targeted operations. But on the more positive side of things in the current news, uh, we often hear, Fabian and I, that... Uh, the ECB is described by, by many commentators as the glue that keeps the, European, the Eurozone uh, together in these times of adversity. Would you agree with this assessment? So, I mean, the ECB obviously is unique in, ha in having this 
uh, the responsibility that we we have a European Union, uh, which is a remarkable uh, uh, framework because it doesn't fit into either category too easily. It is not a federal system. So quite often, uh, you know, and I'm sure maybe in many of the studies you read as students, uh, there's, a co- there's a comparison. Why can't the European Union be like the United States of America? Yeah, yeah. But do you ever see these comments, no. this valuation of the ECB as, as, as doing damage to your legitimacy? Well, let, let me just continue the, 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 the point here right. is uh, it's, it's, you know, not always so easy to communicate because it's essentially easy to have a, a kind of a either or. You either have a federal state like the U.S. or you have a nation state. And of course, as you know, the European Union is a hybrid. Yeah. Uh, by and large, most power remains with the nation state. But within the framework of uh, the single market, uh, the freedom to travel, uh, more and more uh, significant uh, European institutions like the European Stability Mechanism, the European Investment Bank, plus the single currency. So we have a unique framework. Uh, And by the way, in surveys, there's a Euro barometer, European-wide survey. The Euro is quite popular. So I think people appreciate this. But it, it, it is a headache if you're studying political science, uh, <laughs> if you study uh, yeah. other institutional uh, frameworks, because there's no exact comparison. So we are operating in a situation where, at one level, the treaty is very clear. Yeah. So we, we have a very clear European treaty. Uh, but what's also fair to say is that uh, when the ECB was set up in the mid-late 90s, the events that have happened more recently were not fully anticipated. So it's also important to appreciate uh, the European monetary system has to evolve. And there was a big evolution in uh, 2012 with the banking union and with the create, creation of the European stability mechanism. So you know it's not the case that the euro today, the ECB today is the same as 20 years ago. So it's a kind of dynamic evolving situation um, and, you know, so it's, of course, it's, a, it's an easy point to make the contrast between having a single currency and uh, 19 uh, sovereigns. Yeah. But, you know, I think uh, this, this uh, works in its unique way. Uh, and if you like, there's, there's always a discussion about the balance between central fiscal capacity and national. But I think that that that's secondary. The the euro can operate under many different uh, uh, options in terms of fiscal policy. And Mr. Lane, now we're going to go back towards discussing some of the very interesting tools that you mentioned in your remarks. And the first one we want to um, refer to is the targeted long-term refinancing operations, or the so-called Taltros for the people in, in central yeah. banks, um, which are basically cheap loans that the ECB provides to commercial banks so that people like like Alex and me and you uh, can get credit and also businesses, of course. You mentioned that there were some adjustments made to the status to face the corona crisis. Could you briefly tell us which were these adjustments and why were they necessary when it comes to the corona crisis? So the, the challenge we face is in any downturn, the temptation for banks is actually to lend less. Because if you show up uh, with a new business idea or there's an existing firm, of course the, your, the probability of you making high profits is gonna be less in the recession than in normal times. So uh, without the central bank and governments for that matter uh, playing a role, the, the natural force is for a recession to be made worse by a credit squeeze a le- less availability of credit. So governments can uh, fight this by offering guarantees. And we know across Europe, there's many uh, credit guarantee schemes. But we can also uh, contribute to the provision of credit by making these uh, the, these uh, targeted lending schemes available. So what we've done is we've uh, increased uh, the volume of loans that are possible. Uh, We've made it easier for banks, if you like, to include their lending to individuals because there's many self-employed workers in in Europe. And then we've we've made it cheaper. So by by making it cheaper, 
it's essentially offsetting the fact that if, if you know if I'm a in a commercial bank I'm trying to decide what is the interest rate I need to charge you to make a profit while recognizing you're a small firm you're risky so in a recession environment that credit risk is going up but because we're pushing down the funding cost that should enable more lending to be maintained than otherwise so I think it's quite a a good scheme. There are similar schemes um, in in, uh, in general in the UK and the US as well. So we, we think this is uh, quite effective, especially, by the way, in a low interest rate world, because you might say, why don't you just cut the interest rate in general? Uh, of course, uh, that's much more possible uh, if you start off with a very positive interest rate than when the interest rate is already low and negative. Yeah. Ms. Lane, well, you've been very explicit from starting at your remarks in the beginning and now that the objective of the ECB is to avoid a possible credit crunch, to make sure that our banks keep lending, to make sure that consumers uh, and firms uh, keep receiving these, these, uh, this credit. And, uh, and of course, that, that is very natural in this situation. But on the other hand, of course, we do have a problem arising from this crisis. That is the non-performing loans. We're seeing that uh, the consumers that are now out of jobs, the businesses that have stopped their operations, of course, they're struggling in repaying these loans. And that is really increasing the threat of non-performing loans for the banks. On top of that, you've been very clear with the uh, low interest rates uh, that, are, that are present at the moment. So the banks are ever less profitable. And this creates a conflict, in my view. Uh, how much can the banks take, keep on lending uh, before going bust because of these pressures? So you, you put a lot in, into that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Let me, uh, you know, I think we, it's important to break that down into different components. Please, yeah. Uh, number one, uh, again, we've published so many studies in recent years to challenge the notion that the low interest rates hurt bank profitability. So the low interest rates uh, has has allowed the European economy to grow more quickly. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the first of all, the amount of lending, the amount of demand for loans has gone up. So in a more prosperous economy, there's more viable firms, there's more households confident and looking to borrow. Number two, default credit risk goes down. Because if the economy is growing, the amount of defaults, the amount of non-performing loans goes down. So, so the low interest rates, we think, has, has many positives. The low interest rates also enables, because uh, banks, as you know, uh, not only funded by their customer deposits, they're also funded by the bond market. Yeah. And when with the negative low interest rates has allowed the banks to uh, raise funding uh, more cheaply on the bond market. Uh, and we've introduced last September what's called tiering, that the fact that the, the, the excess reserves they hold with the ECB now be a negative interest rate, there's a degree of protection against that. So I think uh, the, uh, ability of the banks to to operate is a uh, you know something we obviously look at, but I wouldn't connect the well known and much discussed profitability challenges facing European banks to low interest. You know, to me, uh, you know, yeah. in the round, the low interest rates helps banks; it doesn't hurt banks. But let me uh, mention also, it's very important that there's a lot of lessons that have been learned from the last crisis. So going into this crisis, the banks have a lot more capital than they did in 08. So their ability to take uh, losses on loans has gone up. Uh, governments are supporting households a lot. Uh, and by the way, in, in the Netherlands, the scheme is especially impressive. So even people who've lost their job or have less hours in work, by and large, a lot of their income is protected because there's all sorts of uh, uh, payroll subsidies. Yeah. Uh, equally for firms, the fact that there are also the firms, uh, yes, they've lost a lot of revenue, but if the wages uh, of the firms are being met in part by the government, the losses of firms are contained. So I'm not disagreeing with you, uh, in a recession, non-performing loan indicators will go up, but it's important to be quantitative about that mm -hmm. and carefully calculate the issue. And through the combination of the banks being in better shape, the fact that a lot of the risk is being transferred to the government yeah. uh, through the, their, their response is, uh, you know, I think uh, we obviously keep an eye on this, uh, but I think also, you know, even going back to the Teltro program, mm 
that's another program that is supporting the banks. Absolutely. So, you know, I think uh, we, we have a big economic crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, we always have to keep an eye on the financial system and the banks. Uh, but the, the first order concern now is uh, keeping firms and, and workers uh, going. Okay. Okay. Well, I want to leave Taltros, put them to the side for a, uh, for a moment and move on to a sort of more traditional uh, historic role of the central bank, that is being the lender of last resort. And naturally, we understand that uh, the ECB is the lender of last resort for the banking sector. In other words, banks can approach the ECB to obtain short-term funding and at attractive rates uh, so long as they have the right collateral to back these up. But what really comes to mind in this crisis is the weight of the shadow banking sector. And this is, of course, these are all uh, the banks that are not under the jurisdiction uh, of the ECB and for this reason cannot derive this kind of support from the ECB. And uh, they play a heavy role in the, in the modern day economy. So, so we're wondering, what does the ECB have in mind for this sector? Okay, so uh, let's start with a with, uh, discussion about definitions. Yeah. So there's no doubt in uh, 08, in, in the previous crisis, that shadow banking system uh, was a big issue. There's no doubt these days shadow banking is a big issue in, in certain other parts of the world. And there's no doubt in Europe the, uh, what I'm going to call a non-bank finance has gone up a lot, uh, including in the Netherlands. So we understand that non-banks, whether that's investment funds, like mutual funds, pension funds, life insurance companies, uh, all sorts of different entities are, and by the way, also the treasury operations of multinational firms. There are many sources of finance in, in, uh, in, in the, today's economy. Let me point out a very basic difference, is banks are intrinsically highly leveraged because of the fact that most of their funding is either bank deposits, bank bonds. And this is why uh, banks are always, I mean, that's their job is, is to convert uh, uh, kind of fixed liabilities like deposits uh, to use that to intermediate lending. By and large, that's much less true for, for non-banks. So if you buy a share in a mutual fund, there's no fixed repayment promise. Uh, if the stock market does badly, if the bond market does badly, uh, your return goes down. So if you like, the case for stabilization is uh, very different. It still exists. So it's not, it's, I'm not saying it, uh, we, there's zero role. Uh, but there, you know, we always uh, uh, keep a close eye on this. And by the way, essentially for us, the, the uh, most uh, uh, immediate non-bank uh, uh, framework is, is the money market. Because money market funds are very much part of the monetary system. Uh, and very a lot of banks rely on money markets for, for short-term funding. But there, let me point out, is, uh, you know, the, there's definitely uh, the risk of uh, instability in, in uh, financial markets. So we do, we do have a market stabilization role. And this is why under, in this crisis, we've gone beyond just buying uh, corporate bonds. We're also now buying commercial paper. Mm -hmm. So that's short-term and also, um, uh, even in the, in the sovereign market, we're also buying a lot of short-term government uh, t uh, bills. So uh, we recognize that, the, it's, it's, again, it's, it's the activity, not the, the firm. So the, the activity of uh, short-term debt is something where we can play a very stabilizing role by, by asset purchases and also through uh, liquidity to banks because banks can do a lot of stabilization. So I think, um, uh, if you like, what we're finding out and everyone's finding out is there are many different ways uh, to help stabilize financial markets. Um, but by and large, you can uh, do most of it by directly being active in the market, as opposed to saying, should I let such and such an investment fund uh, uh, be a counterparty for ECB liquidity operations. And now, Lane, we keep everything under review, um, but I think uh, it, it's a very interesting topic. Yeah. So, Len, if, if I might jump in into discussing these uh, asset purchase programs, which are really interesting, we were wondering, uh, 
Um, we've been talking a lot of the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, which is the most recent uh, package from the ECB. Could you briefly um, describe it? Why is it? How is it different, actually, from previous per, uh, purchase programs? So the, as I say, when I started off uh, uh, saying, well, here's what our normal business was before this crisis. So the normal business remains. The normal business remains that in the medium term, uh, we want inflation to arrive in, in the neighborhood of 2%, close to to but below 2%. That is essentially the open-ended uh, uh, motivation for the uh, low interest rate policy and for the public sector purchase program. And we, we have what's called forward guidance. We say that the public sector purchase program uh, will continue until uh, at least after, the, well past the time we've started to, to uh, well, the, the reinvestment after, but the purchase program until shortly before uh, we start to raise the interest rate. So that's, if you like, uh, the normal business. With this crisis, we're in a non-normal situation. It's So the pandemic uh, emergency purchase program is essentially to protect against downside risk. So what I'm saying is there's a risk that inflation uh, will not only uh, you know, without action, not converge to two, even its current, you know, or the end of 2019 stability around one is at risk. So if you have a, a very big recession and you have a financial crisis because we don't stabilize the financial markets, uh, we think that with downward pressure on inflation, it could even force inflation negative, which is a very tricky situation to deal with. And so the, the role of the pandemic and, and program Mr. Lynn, wh is, why is, is basically stability. So, and to avoid that downside risk. Why, why is why is deflation so dangerous for the people who are wondering what, why we have been talking a lot about uh, the risk of deflation, but wh what makes deflation so problematic in your opinion? Well, essentially, it's a bit like uh, raising the interest rate. So if if we uh, if you um, uh, want economic activity today to be maintained, uh, then you want essentially an incentive to spend today, not spend tomorrow. Uh, one uh, way to give an incentive to spend today and not spend tomorrow is a low interest rate. Uh, another uh, way is essentially by having a positive inflation rate. Uh, spending today would be cheaper than spending tomorrow. Deflation reverses that. Deflation gives you a reason to postpone uh, spending because prices you expect to be cheaper tomorrow than today. So it, it weakens the economy further. It's a, so it's a kind of a pernicious effect because it's it's very uh, it, it makes it very hard to maintain the, the right level of economic activity. Uh, that's essentially the issue. And then the other issue is, um, uh, you know, it, it, in that situation, uh, central banking has much less room for maneuver. So it, it, you know, it's much better. And I think the global consensus, the academic consensus, the policy consensus is, it's very important to fight hard to avoid deflation taking hold. So when our starting point is uh, around 1%, it's very important to make sure uh, we have enough um, reaction to the to crisis in order to avoid inflation uh, going negative in a persistent way. And Mr. Lane, Going back perhaps to, to the Pandemic Emergency pro Purchase Program, the PPP, it's, it's, was, it was a quite drastic program, right? It's, 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 it's a lot of, 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 of money being pumped into the financial market, 750 billion euros to be more precise. But before, before this, this package was announced, the same week, actually the 12th of May, we had another package announced which was way smaller in, in magnitude. That was 120 billion euros. Could you please explain from an insider's perspective what was happening in the governing council when, when this drastic change happened? Because we can imagine, of course, that going from 120 to 750 is, is quite, a, quite a step. So uh, what, what was the mood? What, what drove that decision? Okay, let me, first of all, uh, it's very important to think about these numbers in context. 750 billion is about six percentage points of European GDP. 
six. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I think we should not view that as some kind of um, uh, uh, strange number. You know, a, a, an injection of si an additional six percentage points is is not something uh, that essentially is a, in any way overwhelming the financial system. So the central bank always tries to be uh, as forceful as needed, but also to make sure that uh, we we don't dominate the financial system. So uh, you know I'm going to uh, disagree with with your characterization of scale. Um, now, when the history books are written, those days globally, between uh, uh, March 12 when we announced the 120 and March 18 when we announced the 750, um, I think the by far the dominant uh, issue there was just the realization around the world about how persistent and how severe this crisis was going to be. So if you like the the world uh, and you know I think I'm correct you know that other central banks moved in a big way in between. So the dominant issue was essentially, uh, I mean this by the way this is a very important bit with monetary policy. When we make decisions, uh, it's always for now, because we know we can always make a new decision. So it's always the case, and we always say it, by the way, every, and every time we make a monetary policy decision, we basically have a permanent se sentencing. We stand ready to adjust um, our policies as needed. And so in a situation where the movements in the global financial system, the announcements by different governments of their assessments, uh, a lot was happening in those days. And so it's important not to... You know, so what I just said about the agility of monetary policy works in both directions. It, you know, I think one of the lessons learned from the global crisis is it's important to move quickly, because the central bank can always uh, move quickly, uh, and by the way, the risk is is asymmetric. Uh, the risk of doing too little is hard to undo. Uh, the risk of doing too much it's a lot easier to fix that. If you do too much, you can always pull back. Uh, but doing too little can create uh, amplification dynamics, which are very hard to fix. And Mr. Lane, jumping into into this whole assessment of the purchase program, at the beginning, the 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 PPP was very good at reducing the spreads of the member states. So we're talking about the difference in the interest rate between the bonds of member states and the saved asset, which is the German one. But as the weeks moved on, we saw that um, the level of those spreads came back to the level that the they had before the package was actually launched so how how could this happen so let me uh, emphasize that our our role is and going back to the role of the PEP number one it is to have if you like the uh, risk-free interest rates which is you know in the economic textbook the, the main target of monetary policy to, to keep that low. How do we do that? So in addition to the uh, short-term policy rate, uh, we do that through uh, intervening in the bond market. So one indicator is, which is mostly driven by the overall size of PEP, not the details of which particular bond we buy. So number one, I think uh, we've contained the pressure on the risk-free rate. So, for example, the overnight index swap rate um, in, in the interbank market. Uh, and then number two is, now, of course, there's an initial effect because there was uncertainty. Would the ECB uh, be uh, active? So the announcement effect was clear because there's a, there's a lot of uh, reassurance from the announcement effect. And then uh, from that point onwards, and it's going to be an ongoing issue, because we, we, said, we said it again in our most recent meeting, is we are perpetually looking at the uh, composition of PEP, where we are buying, and the size of PEP to assess, uh, is, is this making sure we don't have, a, a, you know, destabilizing forces at work, which we don't want, but we also um, uh, have to also allow a degree of market um, 
pr pricing because uh, in the end, uh, most bonds uh, issued uh, by, by member countries or by the corporate bond market uh, w will be bought by private investors. And so, you know, there's always going to be a dance between uh, the role of the central bank, and the same in the US for the, uh, the Fed or in the UK for the Bank of England, between being a very stabilizing force, while at the same time uh, recognizing that the, the uh, pricing of bonds have to be such that it, it, they attract investors. Yeah, but now, okay. having said that, we also have to recognize that uh, in turn, if there is upward pressure on interest rates because of uh, um, you know very high amounts of debt being issued, uh, if that's contractionary for the European economy, we have to keep on look at that. Well, you know, do we all how much do we offset that? Because we have to offset a kind of aggregate contraction. Um, it's it's not on a kind of a sector by sector basis. Yeah. Well, when, when thinking about this, this issue, Mr. Lane, about the divergence that Fabian just spoke about, we also noticed that uh, it was around the time when the, the, the negotiations on the corona bonds, uh, the so-called corona bonds, which are uh, the euro bonds um, scenario, that, that was the time when, when the negotiations failed. Uh, and that's when we saw the divergence uh, in, in the yield spreads renewed. Um, is this something that, that you have considered? How do you mean consider? So well, course, well, uh, well, the role of Corona bonds essentially. Like, uh, oh, sure. Does the ECB no, no, does I the ECB uh, have a stance on, on this policy? So uh, the, the way I'm going to phrase it is, is the obviously um, in terms of uh, decision making. This is clearly with the member states. Yeah. So you know, you know, we 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 always uh, just live and operate in line with whatever the uh, European system decides. So it, it, you know, it's, it's not for us as a central bank to say uh, uh, such and such a scheme is necessary. That, that, that's for the preferences and the negotiation of the member states. But what is uh, something that we do say, and uh, at least you know, I, I would say, is that uh, it's very important that, you know, to recognize that the joint power of the European Union uh, to, to raise uh, debt is very powerful. We've already seen it, for example, through the ESM, the ESM bonds or the European Investment Bank. We already have a uh, euro area uh, debt uh, in, in, in those kind of very limited senses. And so um, there's a lot of uh, global interest if there were more joint issuance by, by the European governments. Okay. And I suppose the, the nuance with the corona bond idea is, is that, of course, uh, the old idea of euro bonds was maybe uh, uh, not very successful because of the fact that the starting point of countries were very different. You had high debt countries, low debt countries. And so uh, the conversion of, if you like, existing debt into common debt, very controversial idea. Corona bonds, because we, in the end, have essentially a common shock, a virus shock. Everywhere, there needs to be a lot of government spending and also revenue shortfall. Uh, that, as a matter of economics, if the member countries are willing to agree, uh, it's in the collective, uh, it would mean in the aggregate, so I'm not going country by country, I'm saying in the aggregate, uh, this would be a cheaper way to finance what's needed. Absolutely. So for the, in the, and the ECB is an aggregate European institution, so we just make that point. But of course, uh, in the individual countries, the debate uh, looks at different dimensions. Yeah, yeah. But if assessing the situation realistically, it does, of course, feel as though the corona bonds, uh, the eurozone corona bonds, are a bit of a distant possibility now. But there is still a discussion uh, that that there could be a sub uh, sort of corona bonds amongst the member states that are willing to do this. So we're talking about high debt countries. We're talking about uh, Italy, France, Spain, uh, Spain, Greece. Is this, if that is a scenario, would the ECB be willing to support that? So uh, as you, you know, that's an interesting uh, concept, but I, I think our focus is either, you know, we have we clearly have a program to buy what's called supranational debt. Yeah. So debt of the European institutions. 
and we we have programs to buy uh, national debt. So whether that's a central government or, or local government, mm-hmm. I, I think those are the two categories that fit easily into the ECB concept. So I mean, uh, the the idea of having a uh, uh, if you like subunits within the European Union is typically, you know, I think for a monetary economist or macroeconomist, looks like a um, not not in the realm of uh, fantastic ideas. That you know, I think the the whole point is is if you have a, a common institutional framework like the EU. So by the way, uh, you could have joint bonds issued by the whole European Union, even though there's multiple currencies. Or you could have something which is focused on your area members. Those are both could happen. Uh, both make sense. Uh, but to have uh, uh, groups within within that, uh, from a macro point of view, uh, probably doesn't sound like a very good idea. How come? Could could you explain why? Well, essentially, um, the the classic uh, one of the most basic reasons to have an euro area wide bond is with the single currency is you have a single currency, you've eliminated currency risk, and one of the ways, ways to take advantage of that is, is to have a, a joint bond which would be popular among global investors. Uh, if you have, a, if you like, a, a bonds from different groupings within the your area, you don't solve that problem because you still have the substitution issue, which is uh, global investors can switch from uh, subgroup one to subgroup two, and that's that's a source of volatility that we don't like. Mm-hmm. So you know, I think it's it's pretty clear that anything that creates volatility uh, is not going to be uh, in line uh, with what's needed. So if there were agreement with a euro area wide or EU wide instruments, that's a stabilizing force. And then uh, our status quo is we also have the uh, the national uh, nation state. Uh, uh, backed instruments, and I think that's also quite stable in the context of the traditional role of nation states. So you know, I, I'm not going to spend, you know, I don't spend my time uh, thinking about uh, subdivisions. I mean, we either need uh, to protect the member states uh, who are the, the constituent members of the European Union, and also I think support, uh, um, you know financial innovation that reinforces the strength of the the, the European Union and the Euro area. So, Mr. Lane, before we continue our interview, we wanted to make a quick reminder to our people uh, following, to the people following our our live stream, that you are able to write down your questions if you have anything for Mr. Lane, and we're going to come back shortly. So this is your last chance to write down the questions for Mr. Lane, and we're going to come shortly to your questions in a moment. Uh, before we do the audience questions, we have one last question, and that's basically um, that many commentators have talked about the possibility of the ECB um, perhaps thinking about engaging in yield control policies when it comes to um, to managing this uncertainty that you are addressing. What do you make out of this? So for the people in the audience who are not familiar with, uh, with yield control policies, is basically tackling um, promising a, a rate instead of instead of giving packages of, of, of purchases, for example. So you know, obviously it's an interesting idea, and uh, there's been a version a, a version of it in Japan. And uh, one of the interesting uh, innovations in the current crisis is the Reserve Bank of Australia have announced a version of it. I think at the three-year horizon. So if you like it, the Central banks, I mean, there's kind of talk about different schemes uh, where, for example, um, you might imagine, say, at a short horizon, like two years or three years, that essentially it's something that could be looked at. Because essentially, in order to be fully credible, uh, the central bank has to be prepared to buy up everything. You know, in order, you know, if you say, uh, I commit that the interest rate at Two-year horizon would be no long, no larger than X. To back that up, you have to be willing to intervene at uh, big time. That's more likely at the short end because there isn't, you know, too much by way of credit risk at the short end. Um, so you know, I think it's it's obviously uh, has attractions 
uh, but it basically ends up about the question of the implications for the for the balance sheet of the of the central bank. So I mean, it's fair to say the ECB is a big institution. We have a lot of uh, fantastic economists. I'm sure many trained at the University of Amsterdam, um, and uh, lots of people are busy studying everything. So, um, but there there is a an issue there about you know it has its attractions, but at an operational level, you know, it remains. Uh, uh, I think uh, something that r remains to be studied. Mr. Lane, we're going to now move into the audience questions. We have uh, plenty of them in our in our live stream, so that's going to be uh, very interesting. And the first one, uh, the first one goes as follows: Do you think that it would be economically a problem for a country like Japan at 237 percentage debt ratio to further increase its debt to fight the COVID-19 crisis? So let me first of all emphasize, by the way, with Japan, uh, quite often uh, uh, people forget that that's a little bit of an accounting issue because the Japanese uh, public pension system holds a lot of Japanese government debt. I mean, it's an internal accounting issue. But, but by and large, I mean, I think that the most important uh, comment here for everyone is th there's a very big difference between a situation like Japan where the Japanese government debt is essentially owed to Japanese households. There's a, and that's essentially where Europe is, is right in this current crisis. Europe does not have a big current account deficit. In fact, it has a surplus. Yeah. So the macroeconomics of high public debt, when it's been financed by high household savings, and as you pr probably are aware, what's going on right now is there's very high household savings because people are not consuming. So the, the macro dynamic of an increase in public debt at the same time of an increase in household savings is very different to the crisis we saw 10 years ago, where essentially the um, high sovereign debt or high banking debt was uh, joined with a high current account deficit. Because in that situation, um, uh, you know, if, if, if you've borrowed the money from global investors, uh, essentially it's a drain on the economy. The servicing that debt is a drain on the economy because you're making payments outwards. If the government is making uh, debt payments to households, the money stays in the economy, it's much less macro relevant. So that's one basic point about who, who owns the government debt. And number two is the interest rate. Is even for public finance, uh, what really matters is the you know how expensive it is to service the debt. So at very low interest rates, the ability of governments to carry high debt is, is very different. And this goes back to what I said earlier on. The biggest economic question is uh, there's very strong reasons right now for interest rates to be low. And again, I'm not talking about the central bank monetary rate. I'm talking about the underlying uh, real rate driven by saving and investment behavior. And in a world of low interest rates, a lot of the kind of the uh, casual uh, numbers you might think about, about how on earth can a government have that level of public debt and not, it not be a problem. Uh, we have to revisit those assumptions. Right. And Mr. Lane, we have another, we have another question, uh, which is, goes as follows. To a certain extent, the disruption of these global supply chains may drive up consumer prices and thus inflation. How does the ECB factor such circumstances when modeling monetary policy measures that aim at achieving the inflation target? So I think that we recognize that could be a fact. And we see it already a little bit in some areas. So let me uh, emphasize that again in the ECB, there'll be a lot of kind of uh, modeling going on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a very important uh, part of any model is essentially is how quickly costs go up when activity goes up. And one of the stories the last 15 or 20 years is with the global supply chain, uh, the, essentially the costs have gone up more slowly because uh, you can operate at global scale, uh, there can be a lot of scale economies and so on. So if we end up with those global supply chains being broken, or we have more regional supply chains and so on. So it is the case we would expect to see costs rising more quickly as activity recovers. Mm 
that is true. So I, if, if that effect is there, uh, that's going to be relevant. But it's only when it really kicks in is if activity rates are high. But for activity rates to high, for are high, so the economy to go back to full employment, then that's going to be require a lot of demand. So for now, so I don't rule out that that effect is there. But you know, no firm is going to be able to basically uh, arbitrarily raise prices if the customers are not there. So I think initially the, the negative demand effect is more dominant. Though I keep an open mind about that, that, that supply effect uh, kicking in over time. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you to our audience for these, uh, these interesting questions. Uh, I'm afraid we have to move on. And our next section is our final section. And here we do really want to take a little look into the future of the monetary policy of the ECB. Uh, and our first question on that topic is that one of the main concerns that's in our minds that has been spoken about is the high levels of debt uh, that will be present amongst the European member states, the monetary union member states, at the aftermath of this, of this crisis. Do you see this imposing any sort of constraints on, uh, on your monetary policy uh, in a foreseeable future? So again, uh, you have to ask, I mean, I think I'm guessing you're referring to uh, sovereign debt. Right, yes. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but uh, what, what I just said is what we think is going to happen, or it looks like what's going to happen, is you're going to have very high uh, hassle savings, at okay. least for the next while. So you, you're you going to have a situation, and that's maybe different. I mean, it depends on the country. I'm aware in the Netherlands, hassle debt tends to be quite high because of the way the tax system works and how the, the mortgage market works and so on. It is, so what we have is going to be a reconfiguration. But again, let me emphasize, is as of now, uh, my sense is that's mostly an internal reconfiguration. The euro area will be more or less self-financing, but rather than, if you like, uh, uh, governance being uh, relatively cautious, because in the last number of years, the aggregate fiscal balance has been around zero, there's going to be more fiscal action and less private sector action. So, you know, going back, I mean, that is a reallocation, it's a reconfiguration, but probably that's what's needed to, to keep the European economy uh, moving. And I, I think the discussion about debt, I mean, I, I invite you, because if you go back, and I know actually in, in the University of there's a very good macro group, if you go back and look about, well, how does the macro economy work? Uh, with with levels of uh, uh, public debt versus levels of household savings and so on, and working out in under what circumstances is this a macro issue? I mean, I, I think that there's many scenarios. So again, uh, it's very important that what we have now is so different to ten years ago, because at that point, you know, so so it's really important to keep it uh, look uh, honestly, straightforwardly, uh, but also recognise the dynamics of debt are very different in a low interest rate world. So Mr. Lane, thank you very much for, for that answer. We're going to move towards a perhaps a more um, core issue when it comes to central banks. And that's something that is a question that has been posed by many people in terms of the high level of uncertainty that we're living on under. And Madame Lagarde has been very explicit about it. And that deal, that, that brings us to ask you, are you thinking about changing the basket in which you use inflation, in which you measure inflation with? Because that's, of course, um, something that in the corona time and perhaps even afterwards will, will change the way people consume things. Have there been discussions about the, the basket internally in the ECB? Okay, so, so we definitely have looked at this. So spending patterns right now in uh, March and April have been quite different to normal. There's no doubt about that. Uh, well, first one, number one is may say the level of consumption has gone down. So what we just talked about, a lot of people are just not spending, they're, they're saving. Uh, and that's partly for saving because what you'd normally spend on, you can't because the activity is restricted. And uh, there's definitely more uh, eating at home, less eating in restaurants, uh, less spending on travel. So yeah, we've looked at all of that and it's, it's, it's uh, in the overall terms, it's not making that like it could in principle, but in the actual quantitative calculation, uh, there's some forces raising the inflation rate, some forces lowering the inflation rate. 
So in the overall scheme of things, it's not really having a dramatic effect. And which so are we definitely, you know, we do make those adjustments. So you know, the the uh, um, that that's pretty obvious. Uh, we should do that, and we are doing it. And which are uh, there's the, no doubt about that. The I was I was just wondering because you mentioned that there were some pressures up for inflation. Would you would you mind in telling us which are which where do they come from? Well, essentially, uh, <laughs> the core area is food because there's, there's a lot of people uh, demanding. Uh, you know, supermarkets are very busy. I mean, that's really the, 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 the most uh, obvious area. I'm pretty sure the cost of medical equipment is going up as well, so for obvious reasons. So. Okay. Well, Mr. Lane, I'm afraid we are coming to the closure of our interview, but we do have one more concluding question for you. Um, well, history has taught us, Mr. Lane, that uh, sometimes it can be enough to, as, as, as one sentence, one phrase, such as whatever it takes to save the world. Uh, what is the sentence that we're looking for this time, Mr. Lane? Um, okay, so uh, you put me on the spot there. Uh, but so my my own uh, personal sense is, uh, and again from the point of view of the ECB, uh, my sense is the ECB will do its job. We, we're going to do our job. Thank you. And uh, uh, there's a lot of headaches to solve. You shouldn't be worrying about the central bank. We'll do our job. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. That's definitely reassuring. And Mr. Lane, we would like to thank you immensely for joining us. We hope that uh, next time you're able to join us in our couches by Reuters Island and having all our beautiful audience right there um, asking their questions live. But for now, we would just want to thank you once more for your presence and for your answers, which were really, really interesting and really informative for everyone. Uh, for the okay. people at home, thank you for joining us and make sure to stay tuned, stay at home and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.